Welcome to the spirit world, answering your questions on angels, demons, and how the spiritual and physical worlds interact. And now your hosts, Debbie Giorgiani and Adam Bly. Well, hi there, and welcome to the spirit world. I am Debbie Giorgiani with co-host religious demonologist Adam Bly and uh, you, hopefully, on social media, because this is our monthly mailbag edition, and we're going to social media on YouTube and Facebook to see what questions and comments you have. Plus, we have the virtual mailbag that has just been getting... um, uh, just very large, Adam. It's like over, I think, 150 or 160 emails and, and comments that have come in, and we are going to try to get through so many of them. We, we put them together in groups, and hopefully your uh, question will be answered today on this monthly mailbag edition for January on the Spirit World. But Adam, we always begin with the St. Michael prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, St. Michael the Archangel, Defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So once a month, we have a open forum show where you can call in and ask any questions about angels or demons. You can suggest uh, topics for a future episode of The Spirit World. But then once a month, we go into the mailbag and we pull from all the emails and the comments online and on Facebook and YouTube and other platforms that we are on. And we put them all together on one document that is very, very, very long. I'm just telling you, folks, I want you to feel sorry for us because Adam and I want to get to every single question that you have. Some of you have sent in um, very lengthy descriptions of what's going on in your life. So we, Adam and I have come up with t- just this morning with an idea that we think might work. Um, and we'll share that later in the show. But Adam, um, if you're ready, let's dive right into uh, some of the questions. And if you'd like to get a question in right now, you can go on YouTube uh, at GRN online. You can go on YouTube and post your question there. We have Lori and Carol and Tim in place to retrieve all all of the social media and online um, comments and questions that come in, or you can go on Facebook and like us there at the spirit world podcast. Okay. And put your question in um, there and we will get to it, but let's go uh, first to Brian who sent in this question, Adam Brian from Charlottesville, Virginia said, uh, asked the question in going to the cemetery, can spirits follow you home? Now, Adam, before you answer this question, I love visiting Uh, cemeteries. I love going to Catholic cemeteries. I love praying. I love being there. I, Marty and I have our crypt there and it's all paid for. I love visiting it. It's next to my parents. Um, So before you answer, I just wanted to let you know that I I visit a cemetery on on a regular basis. Well, sure, Deb. And, you know, praying for the dead is, is one of the charitable, charitable acts that we're supposed to do. So you know, visiting a cemetery and praying for the poor souls is, is a great thing. You can also pray for them at Mass or any time. Um, you know, are cemeteries problematic? Spiritually, no. Um, you know, souls are not hanging out with their bodies. You know, this idea of um, that the soul's with the body or that the soul is lost, these are not... Um, ideas from the Christian worldview. So we understand when we die, we immediately are in our judgment with Jesus. From there, we go to either purgatory, heaven, or hell, and we stay in those conditions. So um, there's not spirits at the cemetery to follow you home. Now, the only exception to this is, um, well, there's two exceptions, possibly. One would be for the people that go and ghost hunt in a cemetery, thinking that there's spirits there. If you're engaging in spirit communication, which is, of course, forbidden, it's necromancy, you're calling up the dead to con- you know, communicate with them. Um, if you're engaging in that, uh, demons are going to answer those queries, and they're going to pretend to be whatever you know, you're looking for, at least initially, uh, to get you into a relationship with them. So if you go to a cemetery and you ghost hunt, 
It's possible you're going to develop a, a relationship with the spirit there through ghost hunting that will then um, be able to follow you, so to speak. So that's one exception. The other exception, sadly, there are some cemeteries, particularly when they are secluded and um, maybe not as observable from the road, there are some situations where people will go there to do rituals from the occult. And if you see indications of ritual activity, you know, not great, certainly let whoever owns a cemetery know that. Um, but there can be bad things around those situations. Now, just walking through doesn't mean they have the right the right to follow you home. Um, but hanging out in a location where there's been dark occult activity is not good. Um, so you want to let, you know, the proper people know. But don't don't think, oh, I walked up on that situation, so now I've got a problem. Because you didn't have any act of the will. You know, you weren't the person doing the, the, the occult activity. But, um, yeah, so those are kind of the, the two footnotes on that. But basically, fine, and uh, pray for the dead. So I have to share with you, in the Catholic cemetery that's, that my husband and I have our um, crypt at, um, I find it very peaceful. There's a beautiful um, section of the cemetery that, that has they, it, all the priests of our diocese. They're all um, buried there, you know, and it's it's just so amazing. Every time I leave the cemetery, I don't feel down. I feel very alive, actually. It's really quite beautiful if you can get into that mystical sense of, of the what what's to come, the afterlife, right, and how wonderful it is. And these are all Catholic brothers and sisters or Christian brothers and sisters that are that are buried in this beautiful cemetery. And then you have statues of... Our Lady and and Jesus. There's one of uh, Padre Pio there at, at this particular cemetery that I visit all the time, and so I really I really love it. And but I know that cemeteries in these movies, these kind of gory uh, movies that are on TV and and in the movie theaters, it's gotten a ba- it's gotten a bad rap, hasn't it, Adam? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the other reason it probably feels good, Deb, is cemeteries, Catholic cemeteries at least, are blessed. So, you know, there's quite a solemn blessing that's involved when a Catholic cemetery is established. So you're walking on, you know, holy ground quite literally when you're there. But yes, the movies have given them a bad rap um, because Hollywood likes, you know, the association with death is it gives people the creeps. And so they -hmm. like to set things in those uh, situations. Right, right. Okay, so we've got Facebook questions coming in. That is great. You guys are responding online. You like this uh, format. We are streaming live today. So thank you, Tim Mott, our senior producer, who's doing such a fine job. We want to thank Carol and Lori monitoring the online comments coming in. So, Brian, if you're listening, we hope we uh, have that question answered. Um, And we'll move uh, before the break, Adam, to Justin's question well, actually, Justin's comment and question from Springfield, uh, Tennessee. Justin says he feels he has demonic interference, demonic oppression. He went to an exorcist, but still feels he is oppressed by demons. What would you say to Justin? Well, first off, you know, we say so many times here, you have to work with your local people because it's impossible to diagnose a situation between medical problems, mental illness, which is most situations, and genuine spiritual problems. The other complication there is, you know, exorcists are there to do solemn exorcisms of possessed people. Some exorcists also do deliverance prayers with folks because, you know, any priest can do deliverance prayers. But generally, um, you're not going to an exorcist unless you're possessed. Usually they're busy with those type of cases. It's possible that he went to an exorcist for um, oppression, and maybe it was a diagnostic session and they said, you're not possessed and, you know, prayed with him and then sent him to his parish priest. Um, but let's let's assume there is a, a real spiritual problem there, Deb. It, this isn't like the movies where one person says one prayer over you and everything magically stops. This is about our conversion and about us realizing whatever, you know, we contributed to opening this door, learning, un- learning that, understanding it, closing that door, repenting of those sins, um, you know, or, you know, forgiving the sins of others, and then deepening our relationship with Jesus. This isn't about, well, I go and I get this prayer from the, quote unquote, the exorcist who I imagine has more power than the average priest, which is not the case at all. They're exactly the same. 
the exorcist just has permission to use the solemn rite. That's the only difference between an exorcist and a regular priest. So that's kind of a myth that the exorcist is special and different. He's just a priest. Um, it's about conversion, and it's not about like in the movies where there's one magical prayer and everything goes away. It's a process. So as as the relationship with God improves and the relationship with the demonic decreases, there's general, generally, as those two things happen, there's an improvement. It's not a snap of the fingers. Now, there are rare cases where it ends very quickly in one prayer session, but that's usually with a very shallow relationship with the demonic, where the person made a mistake, it wasn't a very deep mistake, um, and it can be easily resolved in terms of their conversion and understanding it. So that's a long-winded answer. I hope that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. Well, you're going to hear the music. There it is on cue. Tim Mott is right on top of things. Way to go, Tim. Thank you, Carol and Lori, who's uh, monitoring social media. If you'd like to get in on the action and ask a question on this monthly mailbag edition of The Spirit World, you just go to Facebook at The Spirit World Podcast, or you go to GRN online to YouTube and post your question there. When we come back, Adam and I are going to be sharing our travel schedule for 20 2024. We have our first uh, uh, wonderful conference we're going to together for angels and demons, and we're very excited about it. So stay with us here on The Spirit World. We'll be right back. Are the biblical miracles too far-fetched to believe? Dead people rising, blind people seeing? How can a rational person believe such things? Well, it might seem irrational to believe relative to our general background knowledge, but relative to specific evidence, the obstacle of improbability can be overcome. For example, it's improbable for someone to rise from the dead. But if there were credible eyewitness testimonies, as in the case with Jesus, then belief would be rationally justified. Second, many skeptics often don't consider the improbability of the reported miracle being false. With regard to Jesus' resurrection, it's unreasonable to believe the apostles died for what they knew to be a lie, or that many different people had the same hallucination at the same time on different occasions. So miracles are not too far-fetched to believe if there is sufficient evidence to justify belief. I'm Carlo Broussard with a ready reason for Catholic Answers, Catholic.com. Stand Tall is now offering advanced group coaching sessions with master coaches highly trained in life skills. Visit StandTallToday.com and register for one of our upcoming group coaching events. These virtual opportunities are designed to take you to the next level of life in your relationships, career, faith walk, and so much more. Space is limited. Hurry to StandTallToday.com and sign up for one of our advanced group coaching sessions. StandTallToday.com the spirit world continues with debbie giorgiani and adam bly if you have a question for the show call 877-757-9424 or email tsw at grnonline.com. Okay, we are back for our monthly mailbag edition here for January on The Spirit World. We are going to social media, Facebook and YouTube. We are streaming the show for the very first time. We're very excited. So you guys can start picking it up live there. And we will start adding um, uh, our video live as well down the road. We're just, we're just making sure everything sounds good, looks good for you guys um, because you love The Spirit World and we love you. So thank you so very much. Tim Mott, our producer, Producer reminded me, uh, Debbie, when people want to send emails, where should they go? Well, here's where they go. TSW at GRNonline.com. Now, TSW obviously stands for the spirit world at 
GRN. GRN is Guadalupe Radio Network. That's how we're being produced. Online.com. So that's how you find us. TSW at GRNonline.com. Now, Adam, we're starting our uh, traveling around the country for the spirit world and for other ministries, and we're very excited about that and for conferences and, and various uh, fundraising efforts that we're, we're super excited about. Next week, I'll be sharing about that, that I'll be attending um, as one of the speakers for the Fullness of Truth in Alexandria, Louisiana, and I'm super excited about that. So to get folks to register there and to come see the uh, wonderful uh, fantastic conference that fullness of truth puts on. And I know Adam, you've been a regular uh, speaker there and that that's fabulous, but together we are, are going on our first trip for ministry on um, in March. Why don't you share the details? Sure. I'm excited about this one, Deb. It's, I believe it's my first time going to Iowa. So we're going to be in Dubuque, Iowa with Aquinas communications. It's going to be on March 2nd. And uh, yeah, I think this is our first trip of 2024, so that's cool. And if people are interested in coming, we're going to be covering Eucharistic miracles and holy angels and various aspects of the holy angels, certainly a focus on guardian angels. Um, so if people are interested in that, the website is kcrd-fm.org, kcrd-fm. Dot org, and uh, that's where they can get tickets and and come on out and you know we'll be able to be uh, chatting with people at the tables mm -hmm. and um, you know after after the uh, after the talks there and just meet people and say hi which is always nice. Yeah, it's going to be a blast, and we get so many things answered, and we walk out of there really feeling just energized and excited about life and our faith life and about guardian angels, and it's it's, it's wonderful. So please make sure you register, and a big shout out to Aquinas Communications. They were our first um, affiliate that picked up the spirit world when we started, and so we're, we were very excited about that. So thanks, you guys at KCRD. We can't wait to see you in March. Just pray that we get there because I understand there's still like snow and it go, it's, it's, but that's, we're going to get there. We've got our, our plane reservation. So that's good. Okay. So on Facebook, we do have comments coming in and on YouTube at GRN online. So let's get to those. And I'm going to kind of put those together, Adam, if it's okay with mm -hmm. you. Um, so Teresa on Facebook came in with this question. Can guardian angels show themselves to you now? Now, before we answer this question, Teresa, let me, let me just, just uh, attach your question to Richard's uh, question that came in earlier. So let's let's attach the two and answer them. I listen weekly to the spirit world religiously. Oh, thank you, Richard. God bless you for that. And appreciate both of you. I'm, I am devout practicing Catholic who would like to know if either one or both of you could please detail for me. Uh, and, and this is in brackets. Debbie, you said a number of times how you've cultivated your relationship with your guardian angel. What is the best information you have to help me in my relationship with my guardian angel? I've read a couple of books on guardian angels, but unfortunately, there was not much information on how to develop this relationship. God bless you both, and I look forward to your response. Okay, Richard, so we're going to attach your um, wonderful email to Teresa's comment about guardian angels. So the first thing I want to share is a couple books and resources for everyone so they can go and explore and learn and research and start to the relationship with your guardian angels through these wonderful uh, books that have been produced. The first one that I personally love is um, Angels and Devils by Joan Carol Cruz. Angels and Devils by Joan Carol Cruz. The, the, the next one I love is Angels and Demons by Peter Kraft. Now, Peter Kraft actually uh, talks about the idea of developing a relationship with your guardian angel. And Teresa, it also addresses how guardian angels manifest themselves. So that Peter Kraft book is very good. It's a, it's an easier read. It's not as uh, in depth of the details of the theology of angels, because the uh, theology of angels is a truth of our faith. And, but um, I would recommend those two books. Also, from a book many years ago, all about the angels by Father Paul O'Sullivan. It's it's a the, one of the first books that came out on angels, and I will tell you that some of the writers afterwards, many years later, changed some of the concepts. But what I would what I would suggest is if you're going to read all of these books, you know, 
bring it all in and, and, and kind of process it. So don't just, don't just take one person's um, angle of the angels and say, okay, well, that must be it. Because there's other, there's other um, understandings of angels out there that church fathers and church doctors have said, uh, doctors of the church have said. So just keep that in mind. And then a website we'd like you to visit is opusangelorum.org, opusangelorum.org. Okay, and it is um, Opus Santorum Angelorum. It's the holy work. Uh, it's the work of the holy angels. And Adam, so why don't you pick up there if you want to speak to that about the great work that those uh, priests and, and lay lay people do there? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I've, I've co-taught with Father Wagner, who's kind of their, I think, the main theologian with them, at least in the States. And I know Father Wolfgang is wonderful. Um, so it's a whole order that really focuses on unpacking the theology and studying the history of the theology of angels, but also guiding people through a consecration um, to their guardian angel and teaching them how to do that process. And it's essentially prayer and asking the angels to help you even more in your spiritual journey, guide you more, help you resist temptation. It's really important to understand, though, Deb, and this touches on the first question, we're not looking for, you know, uh, to start having visions of angels walking beside us all the time, or we're not looking for, you know, finding a way to start hearing your, your guardian angel's voice in your head, or any of these kind of extraordinary things, these unusual things. You know, yes, we know from Scripture that holy angels can appear to people, but we also know it's very rare doesn't happen very often in, in all of Scripture, and it has happened at very important moments. And what I've seen in my life, Deb, I don't know about you, um, the few cases where I think it was legitimate and real, it happened when God did that, allowed that person to have that experience at a critical juncture in their life, um, where they really needed that comfort or that consolation uh, at a critical moment. It's not something that is done casually, um, where it just kind of comes and goes and happens um, on, a, on a casual basis at regular times in our lives. That's at least my experience over the years. I'd like to hear what you think, Deb. But um, I would just say, you know, if you are experiencing seeing something, because sometimes what's behind that question is, well, I'm seeing flashing lights or I saw something out of the corner of my eye. Is that my guardian angel? Might that be? Um, it would be very rare and unusual for an angel to show themselves generally they deliver a message when they do they don't just make an appearance so um, you you of course want to rule out medical problems psychological problems first before jumping to the spiritual hypothesis with anything unusual um, but basically what do you think about that whole issue of um, how unusual it is for angels to to actually appear or speak well in in peter crave's book and he he addresses it in in a lighter more um, humorous way, which I think is quite beautiful. The angels are are very um, uh, courteous. Um, they're they they have they're on a mission by from God Himself, and um, they are to do a, a work. They are messengers. That is correct. But they're also, um, if you look at Psalm ninety one, God's protection. That they're also there to guard us and guide us. And, and so they're, they're also there uh, for protection as well. There are soul guards and bodyguards in, in that area. And so a lot of times, like even in Peter Kreef's, in Peter Kreef's book, um, he spells it Kreeft, but it's, it's pronounced Kreeft. Um, the interesting thing is he talks about how when angels manifest themselves, they'll come on the scene. It's like putting on a costume, right? They come on the scene, they, they will show up, at an accident, a car accident or something, somebody walks, walks up, you know, lifts the car off of the person. You know, if it, if it was a bad accident, the person's trapped under the car, they'll lift the car and they'll walk away. You don't know their name. You don't, you can't find them. You can't thank them. They're not coming back for any reward. Okay. They, they come on the scene and they do that. And, and that's the beautiful thing about the holy angels. So I think when that happens, quite honestly, Adam, in the research that I have done for many years, it actually happens a lot. We just don't know that it's an encounter with an angel, which is so beautiful if you, if you think of that. But as for, you know, somebody sitting there in their home trying to communicate or trying to 
uh, interact with their guardian angel. I know that St. Therese of Lisieux, I know that um, uh, Padre Pio, many other saints um, had constant conversations with their guardian angels. But again, Adam, we address that. They were, they were on a mission um, by God. They had a, a very advanced spirituality. There, there was, it was a special situation, right? For the rest of us, if we started to do that, it be, would, would become very problematic very quickly. Because in, in my research, Adam, and tell me if you agree or disagree with this, you could be conversing with a demon. You wouldn't know. You'd have to, you have to be in a really difficult, you have to be in a really particular place and an understanding and a state of grace and all sorts of things have to kind of check the boxes there to make sure you're actually, if, if there was communication with angels or if you saw angels, is that, is that true? I mean, could you be easily tricked? Oh, for sure. You know, we deal with that with our cases all the time. People that are already struggling with the demonic, one of the games the demonic plays is pretending to be holy angels or pretending to be their friends. And it's, you know, it's confusing for the person because they're, they're going through various afflictions that are, that are very unusual. But then this other apparently positive figure will, will come on the scene and it's, it's a good cop, bad cop kind of game that they play. So yeah, they can portray themselves that way. And it's not to say, you know, every, every positive, unusual experience is demonic. It's not that, but we do need to be on guard against that, um, especially if it's happening all the time. Then I think you really need to start looking at mental illness or a medical problem and make sure those things are ruled out. Mm -hmm. If you're hearing a voice all the time, that's probably something going on with your brain versus an angel who tends to, to, to deliver a message or take an action and then they're gone. Right. You know, from our right. from our awareness, um, they're they're not there all the time as a rule. The exceptions are, you know, like you said, the very advanced saints. They're in a different kind of situation between them and God, and that's right. that's kind of a special case. And also, wouldn't you agree that the they have when they manifest, they come in costume because if they came as their their actual uh, way they they are um, created, it would be it would be overwhelming to us with the mm -hmm. with the sense of purity and light and it would it would it would overwhelm us and also too an encounter with a holy angel you're not going to going to be um left with a frightened feeling or the the fruits of that are a good thing not a bad thing so if, if you're feeling agitated or scared or there's a problem there to begin with wouldn't you mm -hmm. say adam yeah it's all it, it is almost always good to follow your gut so if there's deception going on, usually at an instinctual level, which is, you know, Holy Spirit, your guardian, your real guardian angel, etc., cetera, um, something, uh, just your own spirit, your own soul, um, letting you know. So usually people will say later, I knew something was wrong. You know, mm -hmm. I had an instinct, I had a feeling something was wrong. Um, and what you say is true, Deb. You know, in Scripture, almost always uh, the first thing an angel says to somebody when they've appeared in Scripture, when they're not putting on the costume of a person is don't be afraid. And sometimes the person is described as being overwhelmed, not that they're scared, but it's overwhelming. Uh, mm -hmm. An angel in its pure form is so powerful and so full of glory that they're reflecting because we remember they're also before God in heaven simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, you know, you could think of that as, you know, reflecting the glory of God. It's overwhelming to us. Right. And so, you know, they tend to, to take on mm -hmm. uh, the appearance of a regular person. And uh, in answer to the uh, other questions about angels, let me just, uh, well, you hear the music, so Tim is right on cue. I'm going to hold it right there because we are getting some comments coming in. They want that website again from Dubuque, Iowa, Adam. They want to start registering. It's so, it's so much fun to come together as the Spirit World family. I love that. If you'd like to grow the family on Facebook, our handle is at the Spirit World Podcast. So please like us there. We'll be posting some resources there as well. Tim does such a great job at doing that to keep you up to date on what's going on at the Spirit World. This is our monthly mailbag edition please please stay with us
is a Messy Family Minute with Mike and Alicia Hernan. We love the rosary, but when you have a group of rambunctious children, the thought of praying a family rosary can be kind of daunting. Maybe it's because your ideal way of praying a family rosary doesn't match reality. Or maybe you've always found it just tough to pray the rosary, but it is a most powerful prayer. Our Lady gave it to us to encourage, protect, and sustain us. You may feel like your family is bad at praying the rosary, but the good news is that there's lots of ways to use this powerful weapon of prayer. Prepare the environment. Get rid of phones. Put away distracting toys. Light candles. Wait till everyone's calm. Maybe even on the way to bed. Or take it outside. If your kids are too energetic, do a walking rosary. And don't forget car trips when the kids are locked in your vehicle. And a rosary on the way to Mass is a great preparation. For more on this topic, listen to our podcast on family prayer at MessyFamilyMinute.org. Have you heard about life coaching? Hi, this is Coach Felicity with your Stand Tall Today Coaching Minute. Coaching is one of the things Jesus did with his disciples. Whenever they were stuck, overwhelmed, or even struggling a bit, Jesus asked questions that brought clarity and hope. He then used ongoing conversations that helps them to navigate the path and completely change their lives. Just like the disciples, we too can find ourselves feeling stuck, overwhelmed, and struggling a bit. Maybe you need help in your marriage or with a parenting issue. You're navigating a loss, you want to improve your health, or advance your career. At StandTallToday.com, our experienced coaches will help you to take another look at life, renew your hope, get past those challenges, and step into living abundantly. You can find out more about coaching and schedule a free introductory call by visiting us at StandTallToday.com. Listen, life is too short to stay stuck. Contact us at StandTallToday.com. The Spirit World continues with Debbie Giorgiani and Adam Bly. If you have a question for the show, call 877-757-9424 or email tsw at grnonline.com. Okay, our monthly mailbag edition continues here on The Spirit World. You guys are doing a great job. It sounds like you like you like the live streaming on Facebook and YouTube. Let us know there because we'll continue to do that and we'll add to it as well. So uh, we really appreciate the feedback and the comments. Adam, um, let's stick with the angels for a moment. Uh, oh, oh, the website. Can you give the website again? Because we're getting comments. They said they want the website um, from Dubuque, Iowa. People are driving in, Adam. They, I think they really like you. Oh, no. I think it's all you, Deb. <laughs> I'm, I'm just the assistant. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we're going to be in Dubuque, Iowa on March 2nd with Aquinas Communications. The website is kcrd-fm.org. kcrd-fm.org. Okay. So, and that's March 2nd. So please, it's coming, it's coming up quickly. So you got to register. Okay. Carol on Facebook said, why and when are we given guardian angels and do we need them? So we're sticking with the, the holy angels right now, Adam. And let me just make sure that I, I'm jumping around a bit because things are coming in very, very quickly. And I, I'll, I'll go back and, and circle back on, on something I was sharing earlier before the break. But Adam, um, why and when are we given guardian angels? And if you would like to share the kind of what um, the general teaching of theologians, I know there's uh, different schools of thought on on when we are assigned the angel. Um, what, do we need them? I can comment as well. Um, and and then what we both, uh, based on our research, what we what we agree that um, when when a person gets an angel. Yeah, you know it's it's a good question, Deb, in the sense that it illuminates an issue with angels and that is some people want to have more surety about these things than than we really have uh, enough evidence for so we don't know definitively when angels are assigned right because it's not revealed in scripture um, theologians have different ideas as you said based on what information we do have but uh, God has not revealed everything about the spiritual world and about the spiritual life and that's okay the critical thing is the salvation story. Um, that's what's most important is our journey towards Christ and, and him opening the way to heaven for us and us achieving that, God willing. Um, 
and us cooperating with his grace. So anyway, all of that to say, um, some people, you know, think that it's at the moment that our soul is created, which we also don't know definitively when that is because God is outside of time. It's, it's almost not worth even worrying about these questions in the sense that God is outside of time. Um, so it is likely uh, from that moment, you know, that we came into existence in terms of our soul. Of course, a, a person is the union of a soul and a body that makes a whole person. Um, and that soul presumably existed some amount of time before the conception happened, though we don't know exactly. Um, and I think that's okay. We, we don't know, def we don't need to know definitively. Now, do we need them? Well, it, that's not so much the right question, I think. In, it, the right question is, um, has God provided them? And the answer is yes. So if God has provided them, that's the order of things, and that's good. Uh, does does God, quote-unquote, need holy angels? Um, God is sufficient unto himself. So Jesus doesn't need anything else, but it's his pleasure to use angels, and it is, it is pleasure to have us pray for each other and to move through his church and the activity of the people in his church. He chooses to do those things probably because it fosters more love between us and charity between us. Does he need it? No, he can do anything he wants. He's God, but he chooses to use the holy angels. And so uh, in that sense, we do need them because God has given them to us. And if he's given them to us, then they are a necessary part of our lives mm -hmm. in, in that sense. Right. And I would agree with everything you said and just, just add to um, the fact that the angels are, like you said, it pleases him. He absolutely loves cooperation. Mm -hmm. He's a God that loves for us to participate. He will not infringe on our free will, but he wants that, that kind of group effort, if you will, you know, that team effort, that family effort, and the angels are part of that. And it's, and that's why it's so beautiful when they manifest themselves and do help you when you've had a, an accident or to prevent an accident or, or something of that nature. It's, it's all this beautiful cooperation, um, orchestrated by God himself, but with all of us using our abilities, our gifts, our will, our intention. It's, it's wonderful. And that's why Adam and I suggested the website opusangelorum.org. There is a section there that answers all of these questions. And it actually, in fact, one on the question and answer section of holy angels, it says, does every human being have a guardian angel? And the answer it, it, exactly what Adam shared, the different schools of thought on this. And so what in in my research what i have uncovered is is this that uh, when the when the mother is carrying the child you know um there is that um opportunity for two angels the mother's angel and the and the baby's right uh, and so then it's so and and it makes sense adam cuz think about it you have these you know i i was um, i was pregnant two times right and I, I would always think about this. And, and if, you've ever, if you've ever carried a child, I'm sure you, if anybody's listening right now, you, you'll be thinking the same thing. How come there weren't more accidents? You're carrying this watermelon-sized um, baby in your, in your belly, right? Why aren't you bumping into things or hurting yourself or falling downstairs more or doing, you know what I'm, you know what I'm trying to say? There's all this, I believe, this added protection do I, do I, this is my personal opinion based on research that, that the, the mom's guardian angel is protecting her, the child's guardian angel. You've got two angels protecting this beautiful nine months of the mother and child. And then, and then uh, it's, it's, it's so, it's so like God to do that. Right, Adam? Because the, the probability of accidents happening, you know, it's, it's, it's right, it's up there pretty high, but yet it doesn't seem to happen. And it's uh, often. And the interesting thing about that is that that kind of confirms that the child has their guardian angel, the mom has their guardian angel. And then they've also um, said a lot of theologians have said that um, somebody, people that have a big, bigger mission in life, bishops, 
you know, certain priests that have a, a they're, they're covering a wide diocese or something of that nature. People that run uh, apostolates or different missions, they may, they may be aided by a couple angels. And, and why do you need that? Because that is the beauty of our God. He wants that cooperation. He wants you to tap into that heavenly assistance. And so I could go on and on. And actually, Adam, we probably should add once a month doing an um, Holy Angel show because I, I can see by the response that we're getting from our spirit world listeners. You guys love this. You want that. Now, to the part about do we need them, Adam, I, I have read that uh, actually God understood that we were going to be up against a lot. And we, we needed that that soul guards and the body guards, like in Psalm 91, God's protection, um, he, he knew what we needed to get through this, this world. And so it's very, uh, comforting. What do you say to that? Yeah. I mean, we're born into a fallen, a fallen creation, right? So tainted by original sin. So we're born into a battleground and it is a struggle from beginning to end. And so, yeah, that's part of it. And, uh, you know, certainly Satan was defeated right away, and the angels that sided with him were defeated and cast down to earth to roam here till uh, their final punishment. Um, but they're roaming earth, you know, and they're having an effect here, and they're allowed to. God's allowing that. It's not mm -hmm. that they're out of control. Uh, they're mainly here to tempt us, to give us that struggle so we get stronger spiritually over time and gain wisdom. Mm -hmm. um, not that they're a good unto themselves. Right. So... You know, yes, it, it's going to be a battleground, and the holy angels are much more aware of what's going on spiritually than we are, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So some people, like you mentioned, Padre Pio, certain saints have been given glimpses into the spiritual, but as a rule, as humans, we're not aware of what's going on. That's um, why we have to trust. Yeah, mm -hmm. and there's that one scripture, I don't remember where the verse is, but it just, the angel shows up in response to prayer and says, you know, uh, I came here through the help of, of Michael, who helped me fight my way here to to come and, you know, basically answer your prayer, um, referencing that there's there's constant battling going on around us. So mm -hmm. um, it's it's just, yeah, it's the nature that we're born into, um, you know, and it's, it's beautiful. Angels play various roles. Um, you know, just as a side thing, I've had demons in people, you know, in the context of solemn exorcisms, reference the holy angels that are protecting certain individuals and complaining that uh, this person's being protected and we wish we could do more to them, but their angels aren't letting us. So, yeah, it's very real. Wow, it's amazing. I, I get so lost in a good way in this subject. I could talk about angels, as you can tell, for hours and hours and hours. And we can do that, folks. We can do have some webinars. We can continue the conversation on the holy angels. We absolutely love that. But um, you're going to hear the music. And uh, oh, there it goes. Um, and when we come back, the final segment of this um, January's mailbag show here at the Spirit World. This is exciting. It's turning into a guardian angel show. I love that. You guys are awesome. Please continue to send the comments in by email, tsw at grnonline.com, or like us on Facebook at the Spirit World Podcast, or make a comment on YouTube. We are live streaming today. Stay with us. The St. John Leadership Network presents Glance at the Gospel with Father Nathan Cromley. In this Sunday's Gospel of St. Mark, we have a dramatic encounter between Christ and a demon, a demon who's possessed a man, and the demon screams out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? And Jesus, of course, expels the demon, and it says all were amazed and asked one another, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And indeed, he does. Our Lord never ceases to amaze us because he has all power and all authority. 
How often we forget this. We think sometimes of the word of God in a very human way and we relativize it to other opinions, acting as if somehow or other the word of God had the same value as any opinion coming from anyone else. It does not. When Jesus speaks, he reveals truth. His word comes from the heavens and illuminates the earth more brightly than the sun. We need to listen to Jesus because his teaching has authority. His teaching is truth itself. And the whole world revolves around that truth. We can act like we don't need God's word. But when we do, we do it to our peril. When the demons heard Jesus, they obeyed him. What about you and me? What place does the word of Christ have in our life? I don't think we can give too much homage to the word, putting it in a place of privilege in our homes, reading it every day, and letting Christ teach us and give us his words of life. For more information, go to www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org. The Spirit World continues with Debbie Giorgiani and Adam Bly. If you have a question for the show, call 877-757-9424 or email tsw at grnonline.com. Okay, we are back for the final segment. And just as always, that's why we love the Spirit World listeners and uh, followers. You guys are amazing. You always wait till the last minute to get your questions in. So now we got we to gotta kick it into high gear. So we're, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and try to move very quickly through the questions. We've got some Facebook and uh, YouTube comments coming in. Thank you. And um, we, will, we will address uh, more of, of your comments in, in February. Once a month, we do a mailbag show. and We do a live open forum call-in show once a month as well. Okay, so in this last uh, segment, Adam, let's just go to um, Susanna. Um, Susanna says on YouTube, uh, I want to also love my guardian angel. And um, okay, I want to love my guardian angel very much. How, how can I accomplish this? What can I do besides just saying the guardian angel prayer? Okay, um, Susanna, uh, or Susanna, however you pronounce your name, it's a beautiful name. A uh, couple things. It's in the awareness. It's in the awareness that your guardian angel has a mission. It's in the awareness that your guardian angel beholds the face of God and is ministering to you at the same time. Okay. The awareness builds the relationship. You don't have to get confirmation that they're there. It's a truth of our faith. Look at the Nicene Creed. Thing, um, when we say the Nicene Creed, things that are visible and invisible, seen and unseen, that's the truth of the angels. Go to the Catechism of the Catholic Church on the angels. You'll read it right there. It is a truth of our faith, so we, know we are to believe and we are to uh, be aware that they have a mission given by God himself. That In that awareness, you activate and engage the guardian angel. So you don't need constant confirmation and all sorts of things. You just need to, to know that God has a mission for these angels and a mission for you as well. It's a beautiful thing. Now, the guardian angel prayer, very powerful prayer. I know it was a childhood prayer. I know I, I saw all the, um, the uh, scriptural art on the walls with the uh, Our Lady let, um, ushering the two children over the bridge and the beautiful guardian angel prayer, and it, and it looks very uh, quote unquote cute. It's actually a very powerful prayer. Say it in the morning and in the evening to rec- to recognize that and to be aware that God has the guardian angels in place and they're very, very active. Also to, um, also to the uh, Psalm 91, some translations, it's, it's different, but Psalm 91, look for God's protection. And uh, you'll see midway on the, during, down the Psalm, you'll see that it, it talks about how they will gar- guard you and guide you in all your ways. The, the guardian angels that are there to illuminate your mind and to strengthen your will. So I hope that helps, uh, Susanna. And then we also have a question, Adam, coming in um, from, from one of our listeners that's driving. So we'll get to that in a moment. Any comments on what I shared? No, no, that's great. Let's, let's move to the questions. Sounds okay. good. Okay, Adeline says, my boyfriend wants to ask this, but is driving, so I'm typing for him. I saw an angel when I was five years old, and it was an, an 
in an angelic form. I wasn't scared. I knew it was an angel of God. My mom, who was with me, couldn't see it. Okay, my mom, who was with me, couldn't see it. And uh, what is the significance of seeing the angel when I am when I am of no importance? I've always wondered what the significance of that, and I and I was also in no danger. It also seems like a lot of what you are saying doesn't line up with my personal experience. What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, you are very important. You're very, very, very important to God. You're created in in the image and likeness of God. You were given a guardian angel by God Himself. And uh, in again, Adam, in my research, um, a lot of children have had encounters with guardian angels, especially under the age of reason. Comment? Sure. So, uh, yeah, a couple things, of course, very important. You know, Scripture talks about every every hair on your head has been numbered by God. Like, you are extremely important. We all are. He loves us desperately and wants us to be back with him. Um, you know, my comment on there would be two, twofold. What you saw was... Uh, an angelic form that you saw that was not overwhelming, which is wonderful, and you were a child, and so it was probably a presentation in a way that was more gentle and not overwhelming. That's great. And the second thing is, at that moment, it may not seem significant looking back, but it may be revealed through your life why that happened, that that was, in fact, a significant moment. Let's say later on, um, you know, there's a revelation in the family about a conversation that happened that day or in that car um, that day or some other connection where we often look back and connect the dots with God about providential events in the moment. They don't always seem to make sense. But later when we look back, we say, oh, that's why it was a God was pointing towards this or that. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not trying to cop out and say, you know, uh, just trust and all of that, that it'll eventually be true. Um, But in my experience from people I've talked with, there ends up being a reason these moments happened. And and it was an unusual moment in the sense that you're saying it happened once when you were five and you're not referencing it ever happening again. So if it happened once in your life, it is a rare event. And yes, you weren't in danger, but you were five years old. It probably had a meaning that will become clear to you as time goes on. Mm-hmm. Um, that would, those would be my thoughts. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. I'm trying to go real fast, folks. We're not going to get in uh, any more um, uh, comments today. We will put you in the February mailbag. We promise. We do have another live call-in show next Saturday, so you can always catch us. And we are live streaming as well today. So share it with your friends, please. Uh, real quickly, Jack says, um, I've lost my voice to cancer. Does God hear my prayer? Um, even though I have no voice. Quickly, Adam. Yes, of course. Um, Of course, God hears mental prayer, you know, uh, prayer that's spoken out loud. No worries there. Okay, beautiful. Okay, guys, I tried to turn on the New Jersey speed. I I did my very best. I got Tim Tim Mott, our producer, um, laughing at me. I think he's laughing with me, not at me, Adam. I'm not sure yet. I have to figure that out. Okay, we want to thank Tim so very much at the controls, doing a great job as producer. We want to thank Carol and Lori, our team here at the Spirit World, doing a great job putting together all of the comments coming in. Thanks, you guys. You are amazing. You are going to GRN online. Thank you for doing that. And you're noticing there that there's a Mercedes being raffled off. Well, yes, it, yeah, there is. So check out the raffle there on GRN online uh, forward slash raffle, and maybe you can win a Mercedes. Adam, we're trying to do a pay it forward, and I love that concept, that spiritual exercise of paying it forward, buying a ticket for somebody else in need. What do you say to that real quickly? Sure. I mean, it's one form of an act of charity, um, and it's also benefiting you know, a good organization that's going to help evangelize. So it's all good all around. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Okay, so here we go. We're going to post some uh, resources on Facebook, the Angels and Devils uh, book, Joan Carol Cruz, Angels and Demons, Peter Kraft, uh, opusangelorum.org, also about the St. Michael Stones. We did a show a couple months back on the cave um, in... Um, Italy, and we will talk about where you can get those uh, precious stones. Amazing things are happening here at the spirit world. You got to tell your friends and grow the family because we're all dealing with things, and uh, it is is incredible to journey together, folks. So 
please uh, remember us at, here at the Spirit World. And so next week, we're going to have a live call-in show, a special new content show just for you. And so with that, this January mailbag has ended. Well, we've got a monthly mailbag for fe February and an open forum for February. See, we always are looking ahead, planning ahead. So for Adam Bly, I'm Debbie Giorgiani. Until next Saturday, have a beautiful and blessed week. We'll see you real soon.